Welcome to Cable Vision's Media Leaders. I'm your host, Andy Mays. Today, two Democratic state representatives join us as we continue our review of the 2007 legislative session. Tom Drew of Fairfield will be our guest in the second half of the show. Our first guest has just endured his first budget season as the first Asian American representative in the House of Representatives. Democrat William Tong represents the 147th District, which covers Stanford and New Canaan. Welcome, Representative Tong. Thank you, Andy. Good to see you. So how was it? Difficult. Yeah. Um, oddly productive, uh, but difficult. As I said the other day um, in some remarks I was making at a Chamber of Commerce meeting, I felt much of the time like a newborn legislator, but it was a difficult birth. Speaker uh, Amon was on the show recently, yeah. and uh, he said that if you'd asked him in April if anything would get accomplished, he wouldn't have bet on it. And then suddenly at the end, everything happened. Did you notice that, that towards the end there was a sudden rush and things actually started coming together? Um, I did notice a, a sudden rush and that things started to get tied together, but but I had largely expected that. and and. What um, was really amazing to me was all the effort and all the work that goes into all this legislation. It really does take that long from when we convene in January until uh, when we gavel out in June. Uh, it probably should take even longer than that to really tackle tough issues like energy um, and crime prevention, gun control, um, the budget, um, health care. Those issues are are so much bigger than any one of us, or even so much bigger than the 187 of us in the House and the Senate, that we can do it in a six-month period, I think is somewhat remarkable. What do you think of the budget that was passed? I think it's a good budget. Um, I'm happy uh, on behalf of my constituents in Lower Fairfield County and Stanford and New Canaan particularly that we were able to um, bring home a 23 percent increase in education cost-sharing dollars to Stanford, uh, almost a 50% increase in education cost-sharing dollars to New Canaan, uh, all while um, uh, not introducing a major tax increase. As you know, uh, early in the session, the governor came into the House chamber and called for a major tax increase across the board um, for everybody in this state to fund a uh, major education um, boost uh, in funding. And then um, the uh, Appropriations Committee and the Revenue and Finance Committee responded and they also called for significant tax increases, much of which would have been borne by people in my district and in Stanford and New Canaan. Uh, I'm happy that uh, some of us stood up and said that that wasn't going to be acceptable, particularly since we have record surpluses in this state. And the idea that they were going to raise taxes significantly on people in our area without giving us um, commensurate state aid without giving us the help that our schools need in Stanford, which is one of our state's major urban centers. Without that kind of help, it wasn't going to work for us. Are you satisfied with the increase in education cost sharing? I'm very happy with it. Um, certainly we could, um, we can always, always ask for more. We'd like to see more, but to see a 23 percent increase um, for one town, Stanford, and a 50 percent increase in New Canaan, I think is historic, and it, it's, it, it was a great moment to have that happen for us, particularly after all the uncertainty and, frankly, um, some of the contentiousness over the budget negotiations. One of your concerns uh, going into the session, one of the things you had mentioned earlier, was zone gas pricing. Yep. What happened with that? Well, we made significant progress uh, in that area. The one thing, uh, the major thing I think I learned was that going up against big oil in the General Assembly is not an easy task. Okay. And frankly, at times, it's a pretty lonely task, particularly for those of us down here in Fairfield County who are hit the worst by zone gasoline pricing. As and you know. I, we should probably yep. explain to people zone gas pricing refers to the practice of charging different prices for gasoline in different areas of a state, not necessarily related to anything, or at least not that I know, aside from the fact that you know, that's where the income is. Right. Maybe I'm over, over, over well, um, you know, op opponents of what we're trying to do and supporters of zone gas pricing would disagree, of course, but, but I don't see a meaningful market reason, a meaningful cost reason, a justifiable reason why gas should be more expensive in Stanford than it is in Norwalk and than it is in Meriden. 
And that's what zone gas pricing produces, in my opinion, in anti-competitive um, and unfair gas price around the state. And part of it is because that's what the market will bear, and the other part of it is because our oil companies, um, and there are a very small number of them, um, have close to monopoly power. And if not monopoly power, then oligarchic power in the state, and they mm -hmm. can essentially push consumers around and service stations around and charge us what they want to charge us. And they do charge us more in Stanford and New Canaan uh, because they think we'll pay it, and they know we'll pay it. And I think that's fundamentally unfair. What they did was they hired three professors from Quinnipiac University to come to the legislature with a purported study that they had done, that they were paid $40,000 by big oil to do. And they went around from committee to committee brandishing this study, saying that, well, actually, a ban on zone gas pricing would not reduce prices. It would raise prices. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, that kind of study from three distinguished academics at a major research university in our state got some traction with people. Um, but something really smelled fishy with that study. And as a member of the Energy and Technology Committee, I had the opportunity to ask questions of one of the lead professors on that study. And we discovered that um, the study really didn't study a ban on zone gas pricing. And it was faulty in many respects. For example, they purported to project what would happen with retail prices without any information and without any data on retail prices. Mm -hmm. So what was great was that uh, at first, these professors showed up and Big Oil showed up with this study that they thought would settle the matter. And in fact, we were able to turn that around on them and say, well, actually, your study doesn't say anything of the sort. It, it doesn't prove that a ban on zone gas pricing would raise prices. Um, in fact, it's quite a, quite a disingenuous bought and paid for study. Um, and we're not going to accept the opinion of these hired guns. Do you think coming up next year, you have a better chance now having been through this past year? You know, as the Attorney General has said, um, the, the fact is, the worse it gets in gas prices, the better it gets for a ban on zone gas pricing. Um, as the prices approach $4, and as they go over $4, um, people are really going to be clamoring even more for real substantive change on gasoline prices. And they're going to begin to understand how anti-competitive and how unfair zone gas pricing is. See, the really funny thing is there are a number of legislators who have been um, convinced or receptive to Big Oil's arguments that if we ban zone gas pricing and reduce prices in Fairfield County, that somehow prices will go up in their neighborhoods across the state. And in fact, what they say is that we, Big Oil, um, believe that it will increase prices for all of you consumers and we're on your side. Well, something like that doesn't really ring true. If big oil is going to make so much more money with a ban on zone gas pricing, why are they fighting it so hard? Your cynicism is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's step back from gasoline and to, and to look, take a look at energy as a whole. Sure. It was an energy reform bill that was passed. Yeah, major bill. Yeah. Uh, people are sitting around, they're looking, they're saying, A, we need to do something for the environment, but B, I'm also paying too much for electricity and my uh, heat and everything else. What does this have for your constituents? Well, it has several big components. One is it uh, encourages people to, uh, and people in my district, to conserve and be more energy efficient. And that's actually the best and most immediate thing we can do to reduce um, gas prices, uh, not gas prices, energy prices in this state. Because essentially, we have insufficient generation, insufficient distribution, insufficient transmission. All these technical issues um, essentially mean that we haven't got enough capacity here in this state, and that drives the price up. What we've got to do is cut down our usage, because if we use more than our capacity, what has to happen is we go beyond what is traditionally cheap sources of energy generation and we go into what's known as peaking generation. And that's when you've got to turn on the really expensive generators that we only use a few times out of the year. They tend to use the most expensive fuel. And in the summertime, when everyone's air conditioners are on, 
those peakers turn on, and that's what spikes and drives up the cost of our energy. Um, there are real incentives in this bill to uh, swap an air conditioner, to look at geothermal heat, to buy a hybrid car. Um, and, and one particularly interesting um, aspect is if you can reduce your electricity consumption 10% from what it was at the same time last year, you'll get a 10% break on this year's bill. So there's a, there's a lot of immediate real incentives to get people to change their behavior. A couple of other things, um, there's, there are incentives and pilot programs to do net metering and advanced metering. Mm -hmm. Advanced metering is um, technology that allows you to pick what times of the day you're going to use electricity and not, and it allows you to get billed um, based on the time of day that you're using your electricity. So if electricity is more expensive uh, during the daytime, you can choose not to use it then, you don't have to pay, and you can use electricity at night and choose to do it that way um, and, and conduct certain activities that require more activity in the evening. Uh, the other so thing that a dishwasher or that's or right, that kind of dishwasher, thing. washing machine, mm -hmm. um, charging all your appliances, mm -hmm. um, which does take power. And if you compound everybody together in the state, it really um, is a heavy load and burden on the system. The final piece of it was, it allows. The final piece of the bill is that it allows electricity um, companies, utilities, to get back in the generation business to a certain degree. What that means is. You know, we in 1998 deregulated and became a competitive marketplace for electricity. End quotes. Right, yeah. right, end quote, yeah. deregulated. Um, at least we, we did our own form of deregulation. There are two schools of thought. Uh, one school says that we need to give deregulation more time to percolate and be successful. Um, the other school of thought thinks that deregulation has failed. Well, what we're doing is we are we're analyzing that situation, but we're saying, well, maybe we'll look back and see what worked uh, before deregulation. And one of the things that we did before was we permitted utilities, electricity companies, to generate power, mm -hmm. to own generation assets. And the way they get paid is they get a percentage of their costs. So it's a, it's a rate of return, a set rate of return, as opposed to the competitive marketplace where if you're an energy supplier, you just go out and you buy generated power and you sell it. This is an effort to give utilities a chance to generate power at a cost of service basis. Let's put up some information on screen so if people want to get a hold of you, they can do that. They can send you an email at william.tong at cga.ct.gov. They can call you at 203-595-9701 or in the capital at 860-240-8585 or write you at 99 Chestnut Hill Road in Stanford and the zip is 06903. I think we've got uh, half a minute left. Okay. Us. What are you happiest with coming out of the session? Uh, I'm most happy with um, a bill that we passed, uh, a crime prevention bill known as the Lost and Stolen Firearms Bill. Um, this is a bill that has failed in the last two or three sessions. As a freshman, I took the lead on this bill in the House, and we were able to get 94 votes in the House uh, and pass the House, and the Senate as well, and the governor signed it, and I think we're going to be having a formal signing ceremony next week. And what it does is it requires gun owners simply to report when their guns are lost and stolen, and it helps us and helps police officers and law enforcement get illegal guns off our streets. Representative William Tong, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Andy. When we come back, uh, we will have Representative Tom Drew of Fairfield, who will recap uh, turbulent session next on Cablevision's Legal Leaders.